Hello YouTube, this is Captain Ball here and it's a very special day because I have four original percussion revolvers from the time of the American Civil War. They are all original, they are all in shooting condition, which means that we have a beautiful chance to compare them with the same cartridge. Because uh, during the American Civil War, even if a uh, revolver makers, maker was a cartridge maker as well, it was absolutely not certain that the soldier received the same brand of cartridge to his revolver. Now, we have a beautiful reproduction of the Johnston and Doe bullet. Eras Gone is making these bullet mods and they are 100% accurate repros of the original Civil War time bullets. This Johnston and Doe bullet is 217 grains weight and its largest diameter is 0.462, which is very close to the original. It has a beautiful heel, just like the original had. The diameter of the heel is 0.430, which means that it will easily fit into the chamber of any of these 44 percussion revolvers. Some better, some uh, not so good. But uh, this means that we can, we, can, we can have a really good picture about the external ballistics of uh, these revolvers compared to each other. And as the cartridge is the same now, that's a clear situation. For further uh, researching the external ballistics, I purchased a ballistic radar. This ballistic radar is very useful if you're shooting historical arms because you can calculate the BC of the bullet, this ballistic coefficient of the bullet, which is very, very uh, necessary if you are calculating the trajectory on longer distances. Now, this uh, uh, ballistic radar is measuring the velocity of the bullet, not just at the muzzle, but also at uh, several other distances as well, actually at five distances. So up to 25 meters where I'm going to shoot these revolvers, I will have five data of all, so I'm going to be able to calculate the BC, which is good for further researches. The Johnston & Doe combustible envelope cartridge was patented by Algernon K. Johnston of Middleton, Connecticut and Lawrence Doe of Topeka, Kansas in 1861. They approached Elam O. Potter of New York City to put their invention into use in the production of military cartridges for the US government. When we designed our percussion revolver cartridge formers, we paid attention to copy the size of the original cartridge as much as possible. The internal volume of the case holds 24 grains of 2F Swiss powder, so the volume of the original cartridge could be close to this one. Forming the cartridge with our former is piece of cake. If you have experience, you can roll one cartridge in a minute. The paper I'm using is called hair curling paper, but any thin paper will work without nitrating. The pre-cut sheets with some glue on one edge are rolled on the double first in one layer. When we are done, we apply some glue to the base of the cartridge to accept the closing sheet. This small piece of paper is cut from the same kind of paper as the envelope. Now simply insert the devil into the former. A few turns and the paper case is ready. Now it's time to fill it with the powder charge. The last step is to apply some glue to the base of the bullet and insert it to its place. And there you go, your cartridge is ready, waiting to be deep lubed. The composition of the lube was one part of beeswax and three parts of tallow, just as it was done in the water bleed arsenal. The other factor I'm not going to check during this, uh, during this whole process is the subjective factors, so I'm not going to care about, let's say, let's say how ergonomic this revolver is, which is very important if you're, if you're looking for accuracy. I'm actually going to fire the guns from the rest to, to exclude all the human errors. I'm also not taking care about the logistics. When you're 
uh, when, when an army is adopting guns, it is uh, not just the accuracy and the strength of the cartridge that is important, but, uh, but the logistics is just as important, actually. It's the maintenance, the easiness of maintenance, the, the availability, of, availability of spare parts, the cost, the method of, and, and speed of production. These are all very important factors. Of course, I'm not going to compare them. I'm also not paying attention now to the to the mechanism of these revolvers. I'm not going to compare which is more advanced, which is uh, less advanced. But of course, there are some points that really affect the accuracy and the and the and the, and the operation of the gun. So this has to be mentioned. But technically, I'm not going to compare the mechanics nor the the, the quality of the materials they were using because I cannot do that. So what uh, we can actually compare is the accuracy and of course the external ballistics, so the energy, velocity and stuff like that. So let's follow me to this beautiful historical journey today. Unlike in the case of cavalry carbines, the government concentrated only on two revolver calibers, the 36 Navy and the 44 Army calibers. In theory, all four revolvers here should have fired the same cartridge with the same accuracy, but ballistics is not only depending on nominal caliber, so this will remain only a wish. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the 1860 Colt Army, as we call it today. By the time it was made, it was only called the New Army Revolver, or the Revolver in Army Caliber. The 1860, or the 61, or the 62 numbers were added by later collectors. They were not uh, called this way by the time they were manufactured. This is a complete new family with the 1861 Navy and the 1862 Colt Pocket Revolver, all made with the same production method, which uh, uh, or the material which Colt called the silver steel with spring tempering. According to Colt, this gave an extra force, an extra power to the shot. We will check that out, how the external ballist ballistics of this revolver is differing from the other 44 calibers. The US government bought around 130,000 pieces of this gun and the Confederate States also bought through uh, open market or, or agents. So this is quite popular revolver by the time of the American Civil War. My original 1860 Colt Army was manufactured in 1862. Based on the cartouche on the grip, the main inspector of the arm was C. Samuel Leonard. It was delivered to the US Army. The overall condition of the revolver is good. The bluing nearly completely vanished, leaving a light grey color, quite common on the 1860 Colt family. Besides the main inspector's monogram, the small letters on the main parts of the revolver indicate the military acceptance. The revolver has matching serials, so none of the main parts were replaced. The grip of the 1860 Army is quite comfortable, but the sight picture is not the best. Rear sight is a notch on the hammer. It's quite small, and when the hammer starts to wear, the height of the aim will move. The bore is 0 0.456457 in the grooves, and 448449 between the lands. The twist is progressive, with 7 grooves. The diameter of the mouth of the chamber is 0 0.457 and is shrinking towards the breech. Altogether, the Colt Army was a very good sidearm of its age. It was vulnerable to cap jam, but let's not forget that we are in the beginning, the very beginning of the multi shot era. All my shooting sessions started with snapping a few caps on the nipples to get rid of the oil from the chambers. My Johnson & Doe cartridges fit well into the chambers and they were very easy to load. Even if you're loading your percussion revolver with paper cartridges, it still takes a lot of time. I'm pretty sure that in the heat of the battle, the average soldier seldom had the time to reload.
I was happy to see that the recess of the loading planger completely fits the Johnson and Doe bullets, so it did not destroy the point. The cones of my revolver are replaced in new ones and the RWS caps are a bit large for them, so I squeeze each of them to have a tight fit. My Colt Army fired the Johnston and Doe bullets with an average of 202 meters per second, with an extreme spread of 24.5 meters per second. The average muzzle energy was 288 joules. The group of the best five shots could be covered with a 32.4 square centimeter rectangle. And this was the last success Colt saw alive as he died at the age of 47 in 1862 January and he was in deep depression by that time because he just could not overcome the death of his daughter and he was also suffering from rheumatism so I don't wish to anybody that kind of death even if he was a successful businessman and a wealthy man well the way he died mm. Ebenezer Townsend Starr was only 17 when he enlisted to the Navy and he made a beautiful service career. He was mustered out from the army or he was retired from the army uh, by the time the Civil War started. He was recalled to service but he refused to come. In fact, he established his own firearms factory from 800,000 US dollars and started to manufacture arms for the US government. A part of that business were revolvers, percussion revolvers. Well, this is his double action 44 caliber revolver. He manufactured this revolver in 36 caliber and 44 caliber and he sold this to the US government. The double action model was uh, uh, based on a patent of 1858, but the single action version of this revolver also existed. It was manufactured from 1863 because the handling and the operation of this gun was just considered too complicated for the average soldiers, so they reverted back to the single action uh, system. Well, I'm pretty sure that this is the, the, the least accurate revolver of all the four we have. Before I shoot it, I can tell it to you because the, the diameter of the internal diameter of the bore and the internal diameter of the chambers are larger compared to the others. Which means that if you load the same cartridge, then it will be loose in the bore, loose in the chamber. Star manufactured his own cartridges for these revolvers, but the US government bought only 50,000 of them. This technically meant that these revolvers were fed with the same cartridges as the Colts and the Remingtons. So probably this is why they were so inaccurate. Also, if you check the back of the cylinder, you see that there are no fire shields between the nipples, which means that the spark of one nipple can uh, enter the flash hole of the other one if the cap falls off. So pr probably this was also uh, a reason why so many chain fires occurred with these revolvers. Although it's a good construction, it's a solid frame construction, it is very easy to disassemble the gun and to remove the cylinder. You just have to unscrew this small screw here and then uh, you can remove the cylinder. It's a good design, but it's overcomplicated compared to the others. This star revolver is also a martially marked piece. 
And I really have to say that I completely understand why it was not favored by the soldiers. The system is mainly designed for DAUs and the hammer cannot be cocked the same way as it can be done on other percussion revolvers. First the front trigger must be pulled a bit to disengage the cylinder lock and then the hammer can be pulled to cock the action. In SA mode the rear trigger is used for firing the gun. There's actually a small switch on the trigger for selecting the firing mode. Just as in the case of Colts, the rear sight is located on the hammer and it's really really small. Even if the system is overcomplicated, the disassembly of the gun is quite ingenious. It takes only a few seconds to remove the cylinder. The caliber of the Star Revolver is actually larger than the normal 44 caliber. The chamber mouth is 464 diameter, but it's shrinking towards the breech. The land to land diameter of the bore is 0.454 inches, but it is 0.479480 in the grooves. The rifling has 6 grooves with one turning 40 inches twist straight. The average muzzle velocity of the Star Revolver was 157 meters per second with a muzzle energy of 172.5 joules. The extreme spread of the velocity was 26 meters per second. The group of the best 5 shots could be covered with a 201.6 square centimeter rectangle. And that's an 1856 model Beaumont Adams Revolver, ladies and gentlemen, in 54 caliber as the British call it. Well, that's the same as the 44 caliber, nearly the same as the 44 caliber of the American revolvers. This revolver was patented by Robert Adams in 1851. It was originally a double action only system, which means that you pull the trigger, it rotates the, the cylinder and fires the gun. It could not be cocked manually. In 1856, an officer of the Royal Engineers called Frederick Beaumont redesigned the system to make it single action and double action. What are the benefits of this revolver? First of all, it has a solid frame. And the solid frame and the barrel are machined from the same steel, which makes it a very strong design. Second, it is, can be fired single action and double action. The hammer is hitting the caps through a small hole on the frame, which means it is safe from, uh, from particles of cap falling into the action. It is a five shooter, not a six shooter, so you have one less chamber, but it can still be carried safely because it has a small safety that engages in a recess, recess on the back of the cylinder, so it can be carried with five chambers loaded. Another benefit of this system is that you can easily remove the cylinder just by pulling the, the pin, cylinder axis pin forward. And also there's an info, important feature of this gun that the hammer is not in direct contact with the hand. So when you actually fire the gun and the gases through the touch hole are bouncing back the hammer, it will not move the hand. And the hand will not hit the ratchet on the back of the cylinder, meaning that the parts will not wear 
as fast as on, in the case of the Colt or Remington revolvers. This is the ingenious design. Let's not forget that in 1851 and also in 56, the locking mechanism and rotating mechanism of, of the Colt and Remington revolvers, which we see later on the Remington revolvers, was still protected. So Robert Adams was genius. The Bemon Adams revolver was adopted by the British Army, the Russian Army, the Dutch Army, but it also saw action in the American Civil War. It was imported by both sides and also it was manufactured in the US by Massachusetts Arms and they supplied the government with 36 caliber versions. Altogether the Bemon Adams revolver is a very comfortable and straightforward design. The sight is a non-moving part, it is part of the solid frame and it is giving a beautiful sight picture. This pistol handles very well thanks to the ergonomic grip and it's really well balanced. The bore is 0.457 inches in the grooves and 0.442-443 between the lens. The twist rate is progressive with three grooves. The mouth of the chamber is 0.464 inches, but it shrinks fast. At one centimeter deep, it is already 0.445 inches, rendering loading very hard. The loading lever is less comfortable than in the case of the American revolvers, proving that the original British cartridges were undersized. The British do everything the opposite way, so this gun is loaded on the left side of the frame. The average muzzle velocity of the Bemon Adams revolver was 166 meters per second, with a muzzle energy of 192 joules. The extreme spread of the muzzle velocity was 32 meters per second. The group of best four shots could be covered with a rectangle of 243.1 square centimeter. And this is a Remington New Model Army revolver, ladies and gentlemen and its history is strongly connected to the history of Colt, because up until 1862, Colt's position was rock solid. He had beautiful political connections, so he was protected. But in 1862 he died, and also in 1862 the US government established a commission called Owen Holt Commission to review all the contracts that the Army had, Army and the Navy had. This was necessary as they realized that this war will be much longer than it was expected, so the logistics had to be rationalized. They met Eliphalet Remington on the 27th April 1862, where Remington made an excellent offer for them to make a solid frame 44 caliber percussion revolver for 12 US dollars apiece. This was much better than the Colt offer, which means that the US government could now change from the Colt contract to Remington contract. And that's my Marshall Mark Remington revolver, manufactured in 1863. The key features of this revolver are the removable axis pin, allowing the fast disassembly of the gun, and a solid frame. The sights are on non-moving parts, also better than on Colt's, but the internal assay mechanism is a copy of the Colt method. The bore has five grooves, the twist rate is progressive, faster at the muzzle than at the breech. 
The land to land diameter is 0.440441. The groove to groove diameter is 0.456457. The chamber mouse is 0.456457 and is shrinking towards the bridge. The Remington fired the Johnson and Doe bullets with an average velocity of 190 meters per second, resulting 255 joules of muzzle energy. The extreme spread of the velocity was 18.9 meters per second. The group of best five shots could be covered with a rectangle of 22.5 square centimeters. Firing these revolvers with the original cartridges was an excellent adventure. These short tests proved that the Remingtons and the Colts are nearly equal with the Johnson and Doe bullets. I created a simple table to summarize the measure of values, so we can distribute the gold medals among these beautiful ladies. Let's start with muzzle velocity. Velocity is an excellent measure for showing how well the revolver utilizes the energies of the black powder. And the clear winner here is Colt, so ladies and gentlemen, probably Colonel Sam was not lying in his marketing. And if Colt won the Velocity Contest, he will win the Energy Contest as well, leaving Colt with two gold medals. But let's check the extreme spread now, the difference between the highest and lowest muzzle velocity. This is mainly depending on the condition of the chambers, so probably this is the less important indicator for us now. But that's the point where Remington finally took over the lead. And ladies and gentlemen, now we arrive to accuracy, or most noble measure. And although it was a very equal competition between Colt and Remington, finally Remington took over the lead with a slightly better group. So the winners of today's show are the Remington and the Colt. And I really have to say that regarding the external ballistics experience we just had, they are comparable. They are head on head. Absolutely. I really have to say that both are really accurate guns with the Johnson and Doe cartridges. But let's not forget that the solid frame of the Remington, having the sight on non-moving parts, they are really more advanced. If the wedge of the Colt wears, 
the Revel very loose accuracy. Also, the percussion cap particles can easily fall into the action of a cold revolver, causing the revolver to jam, which means that altogether the Remington is a better arm. But, as I said, regarding the accuracy and external ballistics, they are head on head. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. You have been watching the Cap Amber YouTube channel. If you like what I do, then please subscribe, also like this video, and also please comment if you have any information, additional information for this topic. If you wish to support me and you can support me, then please do it through Patreon. You can find a link to the Patreon site under this video as well. But you can also buy your American Civil War time authentic percussion revolver cartridge boxes and cartridge formers. Now they are available for Dragoon and Walker revolvers as well. You can find these offerings in our eBay store and in our web shop as well. You can also find there our US Arsenal Stadia Repros. These are 19th century rangefinders, just excellent companion to your historical gear. So ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay cool and keep your powder dry.